Well, good day, everyone. What a time, whatever time of day you're watching this. Um, I'm Ian Flat, and I'm sitting in the luxurious surroundings of Dundee University Museums at Hawk Hill, which is a wonderful Hawk Hill house, which I'm ashamed to say I've never been before, an 18th century house full of history. And Matthew Jaron, university curator, will be glad to take visits by appointment if you wish to get in touch with him. So today we're considering um, from Garden to Eden, the story of Dundee's gas works. As it seems, we hope likely that the Eden post-industrial project, um, as in Cornwall, will produce um, a walled area full of, of lush vegetation and centers of education. Um, it's good to remember that it started off as a garden. It started off as the garden of an 18th century or um, late 17th century house called Peeper Day, which had extensive gardens. So you've gone from garden to garden. So we'll get our bearings first of all. This is at the top of Peeper Day Lane, which still exists. And the Peeper Day references back to the house and its extensive areas. Um, this is now what you call post-industrial. In the background, you have um, new gas. You've got the drillers um, that are efficiently restored on the shores of the Tay, following on from the Caledon shipyard. And to the left, you have the spiral gasometer, the one that's left. Um, and that will remain a feature, apparently, of the new Eden. And Peeper Day House uh, was an extensive gardens, extensive land. And this probably is still its boundary wall. And I gather that's one of the features that attracted Eden Project to be involved in this. And if you look closely at the wall, um, it is, it suggests to me it could be contemporaneous with the um, original 18th or late 17th century Peter Day house. Um, just beyond this would have been the, the area of his extensive lands. There was um, a German engineer here, engineer called Johannes Schleser, who went all around Scotland in the late 17th century with a camera obscura. Now, if you've puffed your way through all the stairs in the camera obscura in Edinburgh, at the top of the Royal Mile, if you haven't, when peacetime returns, I urge you to do so. Basically, it is a camera. It's a large, uh, it's a small peephole that reflects the light down into usually used to be a, a beige, if you like, dark room. And still in Edinburgh, you can see Edinburgh in reverse on a table, whereas what Slazer wanted was uh, it to go onto an engraving plate. So basically, you have a 17th century photograph. Uh, I particular, In all of his prints, Slazer would then add what people did locally. And you've got two ladies um, trampling down the cloth in the, uh, the, the twin tub on the bottom right hand corner. Um, as, as an aside, um, I showed this to primary seven pupils in Newport when I was talking about the history of the Tay. And I said, What do you think these ladies are doing? And they said, Please, sir, they're making wine. So there's Newport on Tay for you. But our purpose in looking at this is to see the extent of Dundee, late 17th century. Um, the Seagate is what it says on the tin. It's the road at the side of the Tay. So all of that had to be still infilled. Now, if you go to Seagate bus station, you're somewhere on that shoreline. And of course, the, the borough extended as far as that. Um, Keeper Day House, if it's just being built, is over the bluff to our left. Um, when you look at the Eden site, hopefully um, you still got that bluff. It remains of a quarry steep. So um, at this time, this would be fairly rural, apart from the ladies trampling the cloth and no hint of industry coming anywhere near it. Um, I'll be making lots of references about the online maps available in the National Library of Scotland. In peacetime, you can see these both um, in the city archives, the city square, 
and in local studies in the Central Library. Of course, at the moment, both of these um, are restricted even, even to staff. So William Crawford made two maps um, of Dundee. This is his first one of 1776, and he's got Pipo Day. And I think what is a generic, um, nice six windowed two story house appears there, but another one also appears at um, what is the reverse of um, David's Lodge in, in Ethergates. Um, so I think this is a generic picture that he used for any house and is facing the wrong way. It's quite clearly from later maps that um, it faces the west. And considering it's in Oblough, um, where does people day come from? Does the, does the sun come up? One of the theories produced for the people day was it was named after the radical people day boys of Dublin of 1780, excuse me. But this is four years before that. So um, this is a place name. And already by 1776, you can see to the east of the house where it wasn't and it didn't look like that is soap work. Now this is the beginning of the end for this nice house because the soap works were smelly and you found that um, effluvia and noxious trades tended to be on the outskirts of the town. So it can't have been very nice already in 1776 to have a snow and soap works in your garden. So already it's on the way down, if you like. His later map was 1793, also the National Library, also in local studies in the city archives. Um, he still got his generic house, which probably didn't look like that, and is facing the wrong way. And the soap works is still there, although he hasn't labelled it as that. And you see to the west, um, there's encroaching on the Tay, and it's called Tay Side because it's the side of the Tay, nothing to do with the, um, the, the late um, the famous local government area. And we've got our boundary marker already. I've marked in red what was the, the Pipo Day Lake boundary. Another wonderful um, toy that you have in the National Library of Scotland is called georeferenced maps. And that's just a fancy term for being able to look at then and now. So they have on the National Library website 1850 Ordnance Survey maps on large scale. And on that, you can clearly see still uh, the Peeper Day House, which was by then being used as a gas manager's house. And in brown, which is the wrong color, I've outlined it. Um, and I suspect the ground, that's quite a steep cliff there. I suspect the ground was, was quarried out, um, so there won't be any archaeological remains. But that gives you a bearings of where the original uh, mansion house used to be. John Wood um, is. Um, another famous map maker. Um, his maps are also in Central Library. But this is the online version. And you have, um, again, red marking Pipo Day Lane, your mental boundary. And at the back, you can see the quarry, which perhaps explains that very steep bluff um, as you come to the, the north of this site. And again, um, a puzzling reference to uh, a house facing the wrong way. They certainly never built two people day houses, expensive houses, particularly once the soap works had happened. So um, John Wood is, is a bit questionable there. But to the West, um, you see quite clearly that Tay's side um, has again expanded and they're edging into the river. So this would be the story of Dundee all through the 19th and the 18th century, gradually edging out into the Tay and reclaiming land. So we come to yet another German entrepreneur, Frederick Windsor. In 1807, he demonstrated the use of gas to light streets in London's Pall Mall. And of course, street lighting, even today, especially today, is still important for public safety. Um, particularly for women. 
And so in 1807, when street pads, as they were known, muggers um, were, were a problem, street lighting um, was, was much appreciated by the citizens of London. In 1812, he obtained the Royal Charter to build the world's first public gas works, which opened in Westminster in 1813. And it was so popular, like the later railways, that within 15 years, you think of expansion of railways, the same happened to gas lighting. Almost every large town in Britain and in Europe, North America, had a gas work. I'm grateful to the National Museum for um, explaining this. Uh, this is a very simplified account, but basically you have a retort where um, very gaseous, bituminous coal is heated in a closed cylinder, and uh, you get the vapor off that, goes into a condenser, which gives you valuable tar at the bottom of the tar well, and the gas goes through to a purifier, and some of it goes to users, and some of it can be held in a gas holder very political at the moment as we worry about um, retaining gas and holding gas. So the first Dundee Gaslight Company started to lay pipes um, in 1825 before the supply was formally switched on in January 1826. And in 1912, um, the British Association of Advancement of Science came to visit Dundee it was a huge success, and they discussed all sorts of things. And um, in the city archives, they, there are pamphlets, very lovely illustrated pamphlets that were held given out to members who were interested in electricity, gas, water. But in this one, the general manager said meters were first introduced. Because in the history of companies, a charge is made per burner, which was a light burner, in use for a definite period. So like um, air raid wardens in World War II, this was regulated by inspectors who perambulated the town to see that all lights were turned off at the time of rain. And this was a great annoyance if you were in the middle of a Dickens novel you wanted to finish and was annoyance to those of a studious nature. Price capping um, existed even in 1823. Um, section 10 of the act was then known as Hume's Clause provided that the gas to be furnished by the said company shall be as of good quality as that furnished by any gas light company in Scotland, and the company shall be bound to furnish such gas at a rate or charge as low as shall be the average price demanded for gas by the gas companies in the several towns of Edinburgh, Glasgow, Paisley, Perth, Marlborough, Montrose, and Aberdeen. So Dundee is behind all of these in setting up, but it's very good that price capping. This is a commercial company that's being set up and price capping is in the data. Um, another map online, National Library of Scotland, also available in city archives and local studies central library, um, was this very rudimentary Dundee gas works. Um, to explain what's happening, James Lensley is explaining the harbour extensions of 1840. So Victoria Dock, which you see at the bottom, has yet to be built. But, um, and then the Dundee to Arbroath Railway is up in operation. But what in your mind's eye you have to think of, the Dundee to Arbroath Railway is on a viaduct and the River Tay um, slushes underneath the arches and all sorts of fluvia starts correcting, collecting to the north of this. So the smell, um, the West End smell, was nothing like the East End smell. So there's a large pressure to fill in. And he's put in here, this can be used up for dwelling houses. So in your mind's eye, delete all that and think of it as a map um, of 1827 or 1828 showing the very first Dundee gas works. And gas um, technology would advance so quickly that um, you see the sites changing all the time. In fact, the, the latest gas holder is um, the latest of a series of, of gasometer changes. Um, and you can see um, it is extending to the south, and there's ground um, owning to Kinlond um, to the right, which is suspiciously like the ground acquired by the second gas line company. But you see the whole thing 
coming out. And the whole thing is accelerated by the pulling of creation of Victoria Dock and the, the filling in of the arches underneath the Dundee Arbroath Railway. Um, on Scotland's people, a wonderful site. They got all sorts of things apart from births, marriages, and deaths. They got valuation rolls. And they have the Ordnance Survey name books. So, as the Ordnance Survey went through Scotland, England, and Wales, it took notes from local citizens. And here it is uh, when they were building, when we were drawing the first Ordnance Survey, 1857, of Keeper Day House, and it's to the south of the Brotty Ferry Road. So, the Brotty Ferry Road hasn't changed, it's still there. Um, and it tells you that the, the first Dundee gas works and the Wallace Mill there. If you then look at the 1857 Ordnance Survey, and this is the one that I could draw the, the brown square around to give you um, your bearings. It's beautiful, isn't it? You can see Keeper Day House with elegant stairs going down to the west. You've got ornamental vases. You've got wells. And of course, that could have been its death now because you have wells, um, you've got a water source underneath and gas needs water um, as well as coal. And by this time, the, uh, the gas works is made. But if you go right to the bottom of the Ordnance Surveys, you can see a chunk of garden again. So as the gas works eats into the garden, um, ordnance surveyors don't bother redrawing the house. So it looks as though the house is in perfect condition all the way until the 1880s, where in fact it must have been pretty sorry condition by then. But there we have it, a very nice formal garden, very nicely laid out. And we can see that um, if we go to the south, the Peeper Day House, um, a very nice formal walk there as well. The, so bearing in mind the, the map of 1840, which showed you the situation in 1826, this is only 30 years later, and the whole site has been revamped, totally new. Uh, machinery is put in. And gasometers, big debate about that. There's no meter in a gasometer, it is for holding gas, but that's what they were popularly known by. Um, engineers like to call them gas holders, but hey, they're here as gasometers. And there's one large one. And um, when you look at the, the site, you can still see the, the outline of that. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven gasometers. Um, and we've got still got Peeper Day Lane as the boundary on the left. And had I included the, the south of this, um, the formal gardens of Peeper Day Lane <laughs> still peep out at the bottom. I, I doubt that they were kept as formal gardens, but um, the ordinance of has kept there. And the other point was, of course, uh, the gas works was built before the railways. So how do you supply large amounts of gaseous bituminous coal by sea? Dundee was importing coal from Fife from the 16th century, it's in the Borough Harbour book. Um, but now you have the Dundee to Arbroath Railway, which connects with, with larger harbours. And so you have to have um, methods of storing that large amount of coal. So you have a coal hoose. So going back to Mr. Windsor, uh, you put the coal in a closed tube and the retort was heated in the furnace. These retorts had to be filled with coal called charge and emptied by hand, which is hot for bra breaking work. Mechanical charging and vertical inclined retorts were intuitive, introduced in the larger gas works in Britain late 19th century. And in Dundee, there's a huge change in 1901. So we can safely assume that um, mechanical charging would have been incorporated in that. The gas is given off, hydrogen and carbon monoxide came through a water trap, which is why you need a lot of water, and cooled in a condenser where tar and some other liquids were removed. Tar, of course, was very valuable. And the gas was then passed through a purifier to remove sulfur compounds and other impurities before used and stored in a gas holder and steam-driven exhausters were introduced to pump the gas through the gas works into the main system by late 19th century in Britain, 
and probably in 1901 in the huge expansion. And that tells that the gasometer held 400,000 cubic feet, which is no mean feat um, in 1856. You then have the curious thing of the new Dundee Gas Light Company formed in 1846. And this brought costs down. But of course, along before Data Protection Act, the old Dundee Gas Light Company and the new Dundee Gas Light Company would not share the lists of their customers. So then, as always, there are some clever people who realized, ha, huh. um, and so. <laughs> Uh, you actually had free light. If you knew what you were doing, you ended up with a free gas supply because you told the new gas light company you were the old company and you told the new vice versa. So by 1850, the street directory would list the Dundee new gas light company was an operation run by entrepreneurial writers, uh, it's the old word for solicitors in Scotland, Steel and Small, and they have their hands in every pie. Um, some people watching this will remember Steel and Shaw. Shield and Small Chambers in uh, Bank Street. And uh, if they include Stephen Connolly, the, the, my former colleague, uh, the archivist of Persington Ross, um, his first days were spent surveying the basement of Shield and Small, which was knee deep and lovely things relating to gas and to railway companies and everything else that can make money. This is from the 1850 Street Directory online NLS, also available in city archives and local studies. And you have the movers and shakers here. The old original Gaslight Company had their office in 18 Castle Street, works at Peep of Day. And all the big guys are there, Gardner of Duddett, Blair of Cookston, Guthrie, Maxwell, and John Thomas of Peppington, with the ordinary directors being Guthrie of Tay Bank, Crichton, uh, James Russell manager, and Christopher Kerr and Co, the writers were also the part-time town clerks, and then the Kerrs were also available with the town council as well. Whereas the Dundee New Gaslight Company, the office were in the, um, the lawyer's office of Reform Street, and Crawls Rock, the ferry road, is just to the east of the Peeper Day house, so it's right next door. Um, with the secretary, Sheen and small manager, John Kate, much smaller organization, so what are they doing? Um, I think they're just getting in the action because we'll say that their works were much smaller. You would think that the new gas works would be more efficient, more extensive than the old gas works. But hey, the old gas works have got seven gasometers. The new guys have only got two. Um, you've got a bigger retort house. Um, and much less storage for the I haven't got any storage for coal houses. And remember, I, I was speaking to you about um, Pipido Gardens. You can see them peeping out the bottom of the, the new gas works at the, at the bottom. So it gives you an idea of the original extent of Pipido formal gardens. Excuse me. <clears throat> and on the clever um, National Library site, um, you see I've inked in where the present gasometer is. That also tells you that uh, the site kept on extending, um, and it did extend more and more. And that gives you an idea of the present gasometer in comparison to the size of the previous ones. Um, so I suppose not unlike the present, well, there seems to be a collapse of the present as all the, anybody who can't afford, the big companies can afford to pay, um, more for gas than they're getting from their customers and take the long view, but it was it was pretty chaotic. So it was taken into public ownership in 1868 with the Dundee Gas Act, when the annual production was 172 million cubic feet. I mean, that's pretty impressive. And then by the end of the 19th century, gas would be used for heating and cooking as well, not just for public safety and lighting. And the Gasworks expanded in 1901 to take on this volume with its own coal wagon sidings and the installation of its mini railway. And small steam park engines were used for hauling loaded wagons of red hot coke and ashes. And by the later 19th century, uh, Dundee is always looking for cheaper ways to light 
the streets. This was always the, the reason why the gas were actually started. And so the electricity committee started in Dundee in 1894 because it was then found it was cheaper to light the streets with electricity if you were going from the beginning and it was for gas. So everything went um, electricity started off as a subcommittee, as the gas committee. So 1868, public ownership. Um, everything is uh, centred around Meadowside as the office and the works for Peter Day Lane still, and you now have Provost Hay as chairman and the, the big Baileys, the Dean of Guild, um, basically Dandy Corporation right up until nationalization in 1948. And by this time, the gas managers are living in Peter Day House. So it's used as a gas manager's house. So it's now converted into offices. Um, it's not residential, although I'm suspecting the manager also used it as a residence. So 1912, this huge visit of the British Association Advancement of Science, um, international scientists coming to Dundee to discuss world matters, a bit like the, the present one meeting in Glasgow. And a reconstruction scene, and in 1912, the manager is looking back to 1901. A reconstruction scheme was carried out involving an expense of 120,000 pounds. There's a wonderful website called Measuring Worth, which tells you everything you need to know, converting from medievals to the present. And it, is, it goes from equivalent cost price of purchasing, a equivalent project price, so I think here we go for the project uh, comparison. And in 2019, the equivalent would be 140 million pounds. So in today's money, Dandy Corporation spends 140 million uprating the gas works. And uh, he said proudly in 1912, the productive power was six and a half million cubic feet for 24 hours. And he said he could measly crank it up to 10 million cubic feet on the present site. Now that's an amazing homegrown production of gas. Um, when you think of the present problems we're having with both gas production and gas storage, that the fact that the gas manager said, I can crank it up another 40%, uh, give me a couple of days notice, it'll be fine. But of course it was using fossil fuels. And they're very innovative because uh, the population of Dundee was under 67,000. So let's say that there's 12,000, 13,000 households. So um, gas commissioners, well, they didn't give free, they lent, in other words. They lent for free cookers and fires. Because I suppose, um, as, as some um, TV producers do today, they, they give you free kits. Um, BT will give you free kits to get to download the internet. Uh, if, you, if you're buying for the first time. So this is what the gas commissioners are doing. We can borrow this gas cooker, this brand new fire for free. And so brilliant because 1912, uh, there's 10,000 gas cookers up there um, using the heat, um, which is good marketing. And then 1934, um, they decided to take over um, and make a gas showroom in Commercial Street. Uh, this is very close to my heart because you're, a lot of you remember it as the registrars of births, marriages, and deaths. That was its later function before it was then sold on to, to restaurant use. But in the basement, um, the registrar didn't need all this storage. And so it was great for our deep storage of seven year storage of uh, bedpan receipts and whatever. Um, we stored them in the basements of what was the registrars and what originally was the gas showroom. And I'm now slapping my left wrist because in the corner was a five foot dial um, that must have been used for, for, I think they were printing on it saying gas quality. So in, in the basement of the um, gas showroom must have been some sort of laboratory that they checked the quality of the gas coming through. And of course, upstairs where the registrars were would have been gas cookers and the fires that you could borrow for free. 
So I was very sad um, when that was given up because that took away a lot of deep storage for receipts of bed pounds, whatever. We return again to the great toy of georeferencing of the National Library of Scotland because this is a 1947. So Dundee Corporation until 1948 runs electricity, runs gas, if you're in a council house in Dundee, you'll be paying uh, your water rates to the corporation, your rental rates to the corporation, your gas bill to the corporation, and your electricity bill to the corporation, a very efficient organisation. And to the west of Peeper Day Lane, um, coal houses weren't sorting it anymore. You need to have vast amounts of coal coming in. So the, the East End Mineral Depot was basically the coal storage of bituminous coal for the gas works. And you can see here, gas works brackets Dundee Corporation. And um, if you remember the, the outline of what had been the old gas works, it's all been rejuvenated. And then to the Dundee new gas works, that's all been rejuvenated. And you can see within, there's not only our rail, standard rails coming into the site, so you then got a mini railway inside that for moving about the, the hot ashes. And of course, Foundry Lane is now known to you as the, the bus depot for um, Dundee, Dundee City buses, Pipo Day Lane as the boundary. Um, so online, I'm grateful to Dundee City Archives. Um, go and look at their Flickr site. It's absolutely splendid. In lockdown, they haven't been catching up on their Dickens. They've been um, scanning all sorts of photographic albums, including these fantastic ones of the, uh, the gas works. So in today's money, there's a million pounds worth of development. This looks very much like the 1900, 1900 development. Um, in, in phase two of this talk, when I get into the archives, I'll be able to tell you what exactly these buildings are. Um, if you're interested in the archives, open the 1912 handbook will tell you exactly what their function was. But um, making Dundee one of the most competitive and flexible gas producers in Scotland. I'm grateful to the estate of Tom Mahoney, who's a great railway buff. Um, so he took this because of the steam engine, um, which is magnificent. But beyond that, um, you can see the telescopic gasometers. So the gasometer that is left to us um, is a spiral gasometer that works like a corkscrew. Um, the first generation of gasometers just went up and down, whereas the, um, who knows? with the shortage of gas supply at the moment, we may yet see uh, the remaining gasometer spiraling upwards again. And it's all there, isn't it? There's this engine that is working on fossil fuels, um, a beautiful site and something close to my heart, but producing lots of air pollution. The gas works created lots of air pollution and worked off fossil fuels. Um, you can see why Dandy Corporation was one of the first bodies to bring in the Clean Air Act and um, discourage people from having coal fires um, of, of any sort. So you can imagine what, um, if you were suffering from any lung disease, what it must have been like to live in Dundee in the 1950s. And here again, grateful to the late Tom Mahoney, who's taken a lower view and to the left of the telescopic gasometer, we see a hint of the, the structures there and uh, the offices in the front, which were there right up until the 1960s. Um, as gas production began to rank down, um, the mineral yard vanished and then became an area for storing corporation buses but still keeping um, one of the, the gas offices you can see on the left-hand side there. And there's a wonderful Dundee Corporation training bus, which has been sliced. So presumably people could, um, engineers could sit on, on the outside. 
And what we've got, we've got an Austin and a comma. Yes, this must be about 1953. 1954, though the offices might be a bit later than that. Again, wonderful Daddy City archives flicker. Um, two telescopic gasometers. Um, this might be before, yes, I suspect this will be before the 1901 expansion. So this will give you an idea what it looked like in 1899. With CR, Caledonian railway wagons. Now, I foolishly thought before I thought about this that any coal would have come from the five coal fields and they would have been NB, North British Railway wagons, just taking the short journey over the Tay Bridge. But of course, what you need is nasty cheap coal to make gas. And that's another advent for it. The, the five coal fields made high class steam coal. But what you want is very gassy, bituminous coal and you get that from places like Lanarkshire, which was a great hunting ground of the Caledonian Railway. So um, that gives you the route. And in the background, you can see the mini railway, the narrow gauge railway. And so you had big pugs and little pugs like dogs. So there's a small pug at the back there and it's carrying, it's, it's pushing not the typical, um, great railway coal wagons, but more mineral wagons. Um, and as the manager said, this would be carrying red hot ashes. And Dr. Baxter of the University Archives um, has tracked one of these little pugs survived, was rebuilt. Um, I forget where he tracked it down still, but it's still in one of these preservation railways. Um, this is a larger pug. Uh, again, grateful to the late Tom Mahoney. Um, so this will be after 1948, after nationalisation of what would then have been um, the London Midland Scottish Railway and London North Eastern Railway. Um, if this had been come from the LMS, possibly, if that was a Caledonia Railway was its ancestor. And uh, you can see by now it's got a, a cow to catch the, the cinders from the top. And so it's um, in front. And by this time, 1948, um, Dundee Corporation gas would have been taken over. So it'd been British gas would have been running the gas as well. And one of the great profitable byproducts of um, gas coal is tar, which explains the relationship with bricks across the road. Uh, bricks across the road then went on to distill tar and they were great industry leaders in waterproofing. So by the First World War, um, the Royal Navy was waterproofing the dreadnought battle cruisers um, with bitumen, uh, distilled bitumen that produced by bricks. So you can understand now why, why all this railway shuttling is going back and forth. So remind ourselves of the mineral yard by this time. Um, it's the bus depot for Dundee Corporation. And the building um, to, to the north of that would have been associated with the coal yard rather than with the, the bus depot, which adapted it. And um, you're looking from Pipo Day Lane, which still gives you your bearing. So, this now phase to now, um, and you can see where, this is another georeference plan, National Library of Scotland. And you can see the green peeping through. So since the, the whole area was cleared, you can see gas coming, uh, you can see green grass coming through already. You can see where the mineral yard was, um, is now car parking, vehicle parking. To the right, the whole of Dundee Corporation's gas works. Um, you can just see that whole cleared site, um, but you can see the spiral gasometer still surviving is on the right. And you can see that all the railway feeder yards are long gone, but at one point you'd have had to come to a breaking stop for little pug engines taking coal. And possibly some Dundonians would also remember pug engines going to the harbor 
and coming out at the entrance to the Tate Ferries. There's wonderful pictures of pedestrians on bikes waiting for pugs going past um, what was Mazer's Hotel. 1948, nationalization, had 12 gas boards, which were known as the gas boards. Uh, gas Act of 1972 merged all the area boards and it became the British Gas Company. Its leadership was supervised by the Secretary of State for Trade until 1974. And this is up to probably the, the 1960s uh, when you have both. Um, you've got the new spiral gasometer to further away and the telescopic one. And the fact that, that both are halfway up would suggest you that they're very busy. And the original uh, Dundee gas offices are still there. And now you can see that as a gap. If you walk along this site, and it's a good perambulation, if the weather's nice, um, where those offices now, it is now weather boarding to, to keep people out. So they have a Bedford van and um, a Morris Minor. The fact it hasn't got a split windscreen would suggest it is the 60s rather than the 50s. And this is, I would suggest, post 60 after great demolition. You can begin to see um, phase three, if you like, um, the new yellow gas pipes. And I would suggest that um, that comes from the introduction of North Sea gas. So overnight, um, if you like, with introduction of natural gas, um, all this technology is made redundant. The Viking field, 1965, um, natural gas is piped in. Um, I remember my aunt's cookers being um, converted as, uh, well, many people watching this will remember the conversion of anything they had that burned coal gas to take natural gas. It must be very efficient and very quick because, of course, you couldn't burn both coal and, and natural gas. It used totally different burners, but um, that happened very quickly. And so overnight, the smell of sulfur and coke and tar, um, the, the nauseous trades, if you like, uh, the Spanish people. So once you don't have a use for buildings, um, you just demolish them. So 64 years after they're built, um, all this wonderful new Victorian and Edwardian machinery is just taken apart. Um, and very, again, enjoy Daddy City Archives Flickr is all online. Um, and in fact, one of these, um, photographs mirrors the the brand new building as as it was created. In fact, it's that one. So if you remember the black and white photograph, um, that's what it looked like new, and that's what it looked like being taken apart. Privatization when Dundee lost its publicly owned harbour. I'll stop speaking at that point. Um, and the, uh, if you see Sid, tell him. Apparently Sid um, was a costing clerk in Rothschilds in London. Uh, Rothschilds were the bankers who, who ran the whole thing. Um, and so Sid was, was a person. And that was, and apparently marketers still say this was a groundbreaking effort because anybody, and uh, I'm ashamed to say, that uh, I bought a few 135 pence shares, but um, unless you owned 1 million, you were bought out. So I don't think there's any bought, any private citizen still has um, a British gas share. So. so it then became a privatized company making money. Having said that, um, you have to admire the late Henny King, who can you know, persuaded them to make 
um, the spiral gasometer into a huge birthday cake to celebrate 800 years of Borough in 1991. And it's still there. That's what it looked like in happier days. So you then got an original brownfield site full of sulfur, full of tar, and Iron Age brown of Perth, where <laughs> groundbreaking, groundbreaking technology, for they used low temperature thermal desorption. No ideas what that is, but it was cutting edge technology, which got rid of the contaminants, the worst contaminants in the site, which then means that you can start using it for other purposes. Surviving spiral gas holder is unused, very topical. As I speak, um, people are trying to work out how to store gas because, of course, gas you can store. You can't store electricity unless you've got a hydroelectric works and you can use unused electricity at night to pump up the water to create electricity. Gas is a physical thing, and if you've got a void to store it, you can store it. So 24th September, The Guardian. Um, relying on luck, why does the UK have such limited gas storage? And that's because um, there was a firm, Centrica and Ruff, which used um, empty gas voids or in the North Sea to store gas, and also some gasometers, Victorian Edwardian gasometers, or things like the, the 1960s spiral gasometer to store gas. So I'm being the devil's advocate here. I'm absolutely fantastically delighted that Eden is going to, hopefully is going to develop this as a post-industrial site. But the appalling fact is we've, we've got a spiral gasometer that could probably supply Dundee for three or four days um, standing idle. So this is um, the publicity shot produced by Eden, their view of the future. Um, the gasometer surrounded by vegetation. Existing design, um, the design um, is, is talking about the existing tall brick walls suggested to Eden. And of course, they're not all brick walls, as you saw the original stone walls um, on the top of Peeper Day Lane, the striking contrast to industrial heritage of the gas works. It's a nod to Dundee's nine incorporated trades, a collective individual trades, um, but they call them guilds, which um, I'll need to mention that guilds in that sense is an English term. Um, the trades are the trades in Scotland. And I also might mention that Dundee's got three united trades, the Mason Wrights and Slaters, the Masons who came over from Europe in the 15th century to build the wonderful old steeple. They have the Gildry Corporation, who were trading with London from 1199 and had their charter. They have the um, Fraternity of Masters and Seamen, who acted as an AA um, relay service for medieval mariners who were shipwrecked, stuck in Dundee, you pass them on to the next port. And they have the Maltman Corporation from the time that if water would kill you, with all its bugs, but leak weak beer would, would sustain you. So they go back to, to medieval practices as well. But maybe I'll throw all these other bodies into Dundee's rich heritage as well. So from Garden of Peeper Day House to Eden, which hopefully will recreate another wonderful garden of innovation, uh, what a journey. And I hope it happens. Thank you for joining me today.